look at your neighbor and say, I'm free. I'm free. No more shackles. No more chains. No more chains. I'm, free. I'm free. Now come on and get a lot of hand clap of praise in this place. Amen. Amen. The Bible says, who the Son sets free is free indeed. Amen. Amen. To God be the glory. Come on and give this choir. Amen. This day be inspirational choir. Amen. Some love. Amen. I feel good today, y'all. I really do. I feel good today. Amen. The joy I have the world didn't give, and such that the world can't take it away. Is that all right? Amen. So we certainly honor our Lord today. These preachers and our deacons and trustees, to this choir, to my wife, our musicians, our ushers, our audio video team, to all the members and our guests. Amen. We honor you in your respectful place. Amen. Amen. Do you love the Lord today? Yes. Don't fool me now. Do you love the Lord today? Amen. Do you truly love the Lord? Yes. Amen. Can you take about three or four seconds and let him know how much you love him? Just say, Lord, I love you. Lord, I love you. I just, I just, I just love you, Lord. Amen. 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 Oftentimes, you know, he, we, we know, he know we love him. We have to just come out and just express it. Amen. And say out of my Lord, I just love you. Amen. Doctor, I'm going to preach. Dr. Christian had a friend. God bless her soul. Mr. Mel McDowell. And she be walking around. It's, it's just out of the blue. She said, Lord, you know I love you. I mean, just out of the she's walking, she said, Lord, you know I love you. Amen. So just sometimes out of the said, Lord, you know I love you. Amen. He loves, he loves, he loves to hear from you every now and again. Amen. But let, let, me, let me get this word. Did you bring your Bible? Did you bring your Bibles today? Amen. Make sure you bring your Bibles to church so you can read along with me in this word so we can um, study and teach this word and dissect and essay this word together. Lord, may have me back. He will have me back in Genesis once again. Last week, I think it was in Genesis 22. This week, we're in Genesis chapter 13. Genesis chapter 13. We'll start reading from the fifth verse. So we we'll go down. I know it's a lot to read, but we'll go down to the 18th verse. I want to read it so you get the gist of the message. Genesis chapter 13. Start reading at verse 5. Amen. You have to stand for me and circulate the blood in your legs. Amen. You have to say amen. Amen. I need just a second. Give me just a second. All right. Genesis chapter 13, verse 5. Now Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents. And the land could not be sustained, the land could not sustain them while dwelling together, for their possessions were so great that they were not able to remain together. And there was a strife between the herdsmen of Lot, Abram, Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. Now the Canaanite and the Perizzites were dwelling then in the land. So Abram said to Lot, Please let there be no strife between you and me nor between my, my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brothers. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If it to the left, then I'll go to the right. Or if it to the right, then I'll go to the left. Lot lifted up his eyes and saw all the valley of Jordan, that it was very well watered everywhere. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as go to Zor. So Lot chose for himself all the valley of Jordan, and Lot journeyed eastward. Thus they separated from each other. Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled in the cities of the valley and moved his tents as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked, exceedingly and sinners against the Lord. The Lord said to Abram, after the lot is separated from him. Now lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which you see, I will give it to you and your descendants forever. 
I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if anyone can number the dust of the earth, then your descendants can also be numbered. Arise, walk about the land uh, through its breadth, length and breadth, for I will give it to you. And Abram moved his tent and came and dwelt by the oaks of Mara, which were in Hebron, Haram. And there he built an altar to the Lord. Let us pray, Father, now, once again, after reading your holy rent, I pray, Father, now that you endow me with your Holy Spirit. Allow your Holy Spirit to fall afresh on me. Father, allow me to preach these words you've given unto me. Allow to give your people the way you give it unto me. Use me now. Empty vessel before a full fountain. Let the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be accepted and I sought my sight for you are my redeemer and you are my strength. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Let my soul want to speak from a subject, if you allow me to take my time, the right choice to receive the right consequence. The right choice to receive the right consequence. Filmmaker Walt Disney was ruthless in cutting anything that got his way out of a story's pacing. Ward Kimmel, Kimmel, one of the um, one of the filmmakers um, that would help Walt Disney in the making of Snow White. Yeah. He worked 240 days on a four and a half minute sequence in which the uh, dwarfs would make soup for Snow White and it almost destroyed the kitchen in the process. Disney, he thought it was funny, but he decided the scene stopped the flow of the picture, so he took it out. When the film of our lives is shown, will it be as great as it might be? Come on, somebody. A lot will depend on the multitude of good things we need to eliminate to make the way for great things God wants to do for us. Y'all with me? My Christian friends, choice is set in motion a series of events which shape our life and the lives of your children and grandchildren after you. If we could share how we all come to know Christ as our Savior, I would guess that many of you choose to go somewhere where you met someone who started talking to you, which led to a chain of events resulting in your salvation. The original choice wasn't a big deal, but the outcome was life-changing. Of it, we all, or, or, or if we all shared how we met our spouses and many of the stories would begin with a seemingly insignificant decisions to attend some social event. That decision led to a relationship which forever affected our lives. 
not to mention our children's lives. Y'all sit with me? Sometimes people make unwise choices which aren't momentous, moment, momentous in themselves, but they lead to tragedies. A teenager chooses to ride with a friend who's been drinking, resulting in a serious accident and the loss of a life. A girl decides to have a drink at a party, resulting in letting her letting down her shyness, if you know what I'm talking about. So she ends up pregnant or with some serious disease. Since seemingly small decisions can have such um, detrimental consequences, how can we protect ourselves from making wrong choices? The story of Lot's choice in this passage here it teaches a critical lesson about life's choices. Since choices often result in eternal, eternally significant consequences, we must choose uh, in line with God's principles. The herdmen of Lot and Abram were quarreling about uh, because there wasn't an, uh, enough land to support all their flock. So Abram Gave Lot his choice of where to settle. Y'all got to walk with me here. This is what I'm telling you. Lot surveyed the land and decided to move down to the lush Jordan Valley. That choice was the beginning of Lot's gradual but steady spiritual decline. First, he looked toward Sodom in verse 10. Then he moved his tents toward Sodom in verse 12. Next, we find him living in Sodom in verse 12. And then finally, if you fast forward to uh, Genesis 19, he's sitting at the gate of Sodom where he is a city official. Y'all got to keep up with me. Also in verse chapter 19, he lost his wife barely escaped with his own life and his two daughters and goes off the Old Testament page hiding in a cave where his daughter may get him drunk and have incest with him. Y'all see it? The offspring of those disgraceful nights were the Moabites and the Ammonites, two of Israel's uh, 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 Pentacle enemies, it all began, if you back up a little bit, it all began with Lot's choice to live in Sodom. Right. 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 Am I painting a picture good enough for you? So the first point is, choices often result in eternally significant consequences. There's a clear progression in this story. First, both Lot and Abram had increased wealth. Their increased wealth leads to increased strife because there simply wasn't enough land for each of them. Plus the Canaanites and the Perserites. They didn't have that problem before. Church, where did we ever get the notion that wealth would solve all our problems? Can I preach this thing? Where did we ever get the notion that wealth would solve all our problems? Because some of the most unhappy families in the world are those with the most money. Where one member is set against the other, trying to make sure he gets his portion of the inheritance. Y'all know how it is when someone die? Ha <laughs> ha, it's tight, but it's right. The increased strife led to increased responsibility for choices. Lot wasn't just deciding for himself. His family and many a servants and their families will be affected by his decision. The increased responsibility for choices led to, to either increased wickedness, in Lot's case, choosing Sodom, or increased blessings, in Abraham's case, choosing Canaan. In Genesis 13, is the first mention of wealth in the Bible. Wealth can be a blessing, 
But we need to recognize something that isn't said very often is in, in, our, in our culture, wealth can be a dangerous blessing. Can I preach this thing? Increased wealth always result in increased potential evil, evil or for good. The Bible says to whom much is given, somebody been to Dr. Richardson's uh, where much is given, much is required. That's in Luke chapter 12, verse 48. When your, incre your, when your income increases, so does your accountability to God. We need to pray, we need to pay serious attention to the biblical warnings about wealth. As Jesus watched the rich young ruler in Luke 18, 24, walk away, he observed, he observed how hard is it for those who are wealthy to enter in the kingdom of God. The Apostle Paul said to, in 1 Timothy 6, verse 9 through 10, those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. By some, for, for some, by longing for it, to, to, for it to have uh, wandering away from the, because it wandered away from the faith, the faith, and pierced himself with many pain. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone, we think we talked about this in Bible study too. Everyone is quick to point out, is it, it isn't the money, but the love of money that's the problem. That's true. But watch this. But Atkins. It's like handing a five-year-old a loaded gun and saying guns aren't dangerous. It's just the people that use them. That's true, right? But the fact is, no five-year-old is mature enough to handle a loaded gun. Oh, y'all missed that. In other words, and no sinner is capable of properly handling money unless he is constantly yielded to the Holy Spirit and constantly on guard against every form of greed. That make it plain enough? So Lot's increased wealth led to strife which led him to make the worst decision of his life. Lot did something. Many Christians do, usually without much thought. He made a major decision based on the unchallenged assumption that pursuing prosperity should be the main goal in life. Lot chose Sodom because he saw the lush valley and thought he could prosper there. See, we're given a clue when verse 10 says that Lot saw the valley like the land of Egypt. Yeah, yeah. For those of you who have your Bible open, Lot's heart was still down in Egypt where he had become rich along with Abram. Lot didn't want any part of the hard life of faith, of living in phantom-stricken Canaan. He wanted to live the good life in Egypt. He never seemed to consider what verse 13 points out. The spiritual implications of moving his family to Sodom. Y'all heard of Sodom, right? Sodom and Gomorrah? Many Christian families make decisions to move because the husband is offered a better paying job. Lord have mercy. They never consider how the move will affect them and their family spiritually. You can't escape from living near sinners. You can't escape that. Canaan was almost as bad as Sodom. But some people, but some people and places are exceedingly wicked. Don't the text say that? Right? If God calls you to such a place as, uh, as a witness, you got to go with your guard up. Because many Christians, like Lot, decide where they're going to live based on finances, not on spiritual reasons. 
I'm going to close it because y'all don't like this. Verse 11 states the problem. Verse 11 states the problem. Lot chose for himself. He and his family paid an awful price. Since many choices are eternally significant, there are some significant consequences, how do we make good choices? Second point, we must choose in line with God's principles. Y'all seeing this thing? It's possible to gain the whole world and lose your soul. Y'all got to get this. There is much more in life than the outward and material. We must base our choices on God's word, not on the assumptions of our, our, our culture. Those principles encamp the whole Bible and take a lifetime to learn thoroughly. There are four basic principles in our text that I want you to see. And I'll be done. Four basic principles in our text I want you to see. The first principle is make choices with value, value relationship over rights. Oh, have mercy. See, the text is in the text. Look at verse 8. Please let there be no strife between you and me. Why? Because we are brothers. Coming just after their statement about the Canaanites and the Perizzites being in the land, this may point to Abram's concern about their strife, how their strife would affect the witness and the, pagan, the, the pagans around them. Yeah. How can God's people bear witness for him if, they, if the world sees them fighting among themselves? Right. Lord, help me be will. Abram Abram had a right to choose whatever he, whatever land he wanted, but he let Lot and let Lot take the, the leftovers. Why? He was older, the chief of the clan. God promised the land to Abram and not Lot. Note, by the way, that even though Abram and Lot both had the freedom to choose, God's sovereign purpose to give land to Abram overruled their choices. Y'all seeing this thing? But Abram graciously yields his rights and trusted God to give him his portion. What mattered to Abram, and what I'm trying to tell y'all is, what mattered to Abram was, we are brothers. He valued his relationship with Lot over his right to choose the best land. Preach this thing, Ross. So much strife could be avoided in family and so much strife can be avoided in the church if we put a premium on relationship, set aside our rights and let the Lord take care of us. The next time you're about to quarrel with someone and quarreling is a choice we make. Stop and think about whether the quarrel is rooted in godly principle or in selfishness. Sometimes we need to confront sin or take a stand for the truth even though it causes conflict. Be careful. Be careful. It's easy to justify selfishness by calling it a righteous anger. I'm going to close this because y'all don't like this. The Bible says in Romans 19, 14 and 19, let us pursue the things which make peace and build up one another. Second principle, make choices with value, godliness over greed. By faith, Abram had already renounced everything visible and opt for the unseen promises of God. So he had no need, as Lot did, to choose by sight. Can I teach this thing? There is a liberal contrast between verse 10 and verse 14. In verse 10, Lot lifted up his eyes and chose the land which looked the best to him. He took off the good life, he took off for the good life and left Abram literally in dust, in the dusty Canaan, where there had just 
been a severe phantom. In verse 14, Abram is standing there wondering if he had did the right thing and perhaps Sarah was asking him the same question. God tells him, in verse 14, tells him, lift up your eyes and look in every direction. All the land, all the land he can see will be his. Perhaps Abram was looking around his eyes fell down to the dusty soil on which he was standing. So the Lord says, do you see all that dust? I'll make your descendants as the dust of the earth. So that if anyone can count the dust of the earth, then your descendants can be numbered. Can anyone count the dust of the earth? Come on, somebody. Lot chose by sight and ended up spiritually and financially bankrupt. He escaped Sodom with his clothes on his back. Phase out into living and living in a cage. The things he saw, the things he saw, and God didn't bring him lasting happiness that he expected. Yeah. Abram chose by faith and not by sight, and ended up spiritually and financially blessed, seeing and possessing by faith the whole land of Canaan. Yeah. 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 Right. Lot lived for greed and came up empty. Abram lived for God and came up fool. It, it helps you, it helps you clarify the question. What are we really living for? Lord, help me to preach. Well, what are we really living for? Remember, the same thing that happened to all of a lot of stuff when Sodom was burned is going to happen to all our stuff when God judges the world. Third principle, make choices which value fellowship with God over the approval of the world. Lot has often been criticized for moving to Sodom. But it is not often mentioned that both Abram and Lot lived in corrupt cultures. To compare the Canaanites with the Sodomites, it's like comparing a red apple to a green apple. The Sodomites rated a 10 on the wickedness scale, and the Canaanites rated a 9.5. So you have to ask, why did Abram remain untoned and Lot became corrupt? The answer is, it's right there in verse 18. Abram moved his tent and came and dwelt by the oaks of Myra. Which were in Hebron, or Hebron, Hebron. And there he built an altar to the Lord. We see again the two things that's marked Abram's life of obedient faith, the tent and the altar. Abram the pilgrim just passing through, some on somebody, and Abram the worshiper bearing witness to a pagan world. You don't ever find Lot building an altar in Sodom and he traded in his tent for a townhouse. He settled in Sodom, blended in with their corruption. He was popular, sitting on the city council, but he was not uh, spiritual, if you will. Abraham lived in fellowship with God and became known as the friend of God. As Christians, as we face attention, if we pull out the pull, if we pull out of the world too far, we lose our witness because there is no contact. But if we blend in with the world, we lose both our fellowship with God and our witness to the world. Did y'all just see that? Jesus was a friend of sinners, but he never taunted, he was never taunted by the sin because he put a premium on fellowship with the Father. And he never sought the approval of the world. So often we try to get the approval of the world. He was in the world with a clear sense of his mission to glorify the Father and to seek and save the lost. Mm. If we want to line up with Abram rather than Lot, We've got to be the people of the tent and the altar, pilgrims and worshipers here to witness. We must put fellowship 
with God above the approval of the world in all our decisions. Last principle, I seem to be boring, y'all. Last principle, make choices which value God's eternal promises over immediate pleasure. Lot's choice of Sodom was based on what would bring him quick gratification. But he didn't take into account God's promise to Abram about the land. After Lot moved to Sodom, the Lord reaffirmed his promise to Abram and even expanded it in verses 14 through 17. God gave to Abram a geographical picture of what it means to possess by faith what God promised. Yeah. Even though it wouldn't be an actuality in Abraham's lifetime, the apostle Paul described in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 10 as having nothing yet possessing all things. As believers, we ought to live by faith in the promises of God. When we face decisions, when we face choices to take God in account and make these decisions or choices in line with his promises and principles, not the immediate gratification of the flesh. We deny ungodliness and worldly desires in light of the blessed hope of Christ's return. Trusting his promises concerning eternity is or, or, or true. The Lord Jesus said, seek Reverend uh, uh, Trusty Graham, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things. He that to you. Most of us want to seek the other things first and add the kingdom of God in later in our spare time. You're putting the heart, the cart before the the next time you face a decision that involves a major commitment of your time or, or, or to move to a different place, make the decision based on how it would affect your own and your family's commitment to the kingdom, not on financial factors alone. If the extra hours and, and, and the move will bring you more money, you need to ask, what do you want more money for? If the bottom line is that you want more money because you want more things, then you're not seeking the kingdom of God first. Well, I got to close this thing and get y'all out of here. You see, we tend to think of Christian commitment as a bold decision to forsake everything and follow Jesus. There is, in a sense, of course, in which this is true. We must make that once and for all commitment. But Lot, but Lot had done that. If Lot had done that, if Lot, 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 he'd done that, he left his family and friends in Ur to go with Abraham to the promised land. But Lot's problem, like many Christians today, was in following through, walking step by step in dependence upon the Lord. Saying no to the things of this world based on faith in the promise of God. Can I close this thing? Someone, Dick and Ray, someone has said that we tend, we tend to think of a commitment to Christ like laying a thousand dollar bill on the table. We say, here Lord, here's, here's our life. I'm giving everything to you. But the reality is that God sends most of us to the bank. And has us cash in that thousand dollars for quarters. We go through life putting out 25 cents here and 50 cents there in small deeds of faithfulness and obedience. Uh, but it's right there in those little 25 cents choices that our lives take their direction. So choices so, so, so make your choices based on God's principles. Relationships over rights. Godliness over greed. Fellowship with God over the world's approval. And in faith, God's promises over immediate pleasures of the world. Because if you have God, if you have God and his promises, 
you have everything. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 20, can I close this thing? For all the promises of God find their yes in him. Anybody in here know that you know you know that when you stand on the promises of God, you'll make the right decision. When you put God first, you'll make the right decision. When you look to him first, instead of leaning to your own understanding, you'll make the right decision. And if you make the right decision, you'll receive the right consequences. Because when you stand on the word of God, his word is true. His word will stand the test of time. Anybody in here know that you know you know. You found him to be a faithful God. You found him to be an awesome God. You found him to be a promised people. You found him to open up doors that man cannot open. You found him because you made the right decision to stay on the path with Jesus. I'm going to stay on the path with the Lord. Every decision that you make, you might not be satisfied, but it's not about you. Every decision that you make, if God is in it, you can't beat the consequences. That's why, that's why some of us are in the situation we're in now. We didn't consider the consequence before we made the decision. We didn't consider the consequence before we made the decision because we didn't consult God. I'm trying to close this thing, Reverend, because my soul is on fire. Lot made a decision based on what he could see. The Bible says, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Can you see God? Can you see God? But you know he's there. Come on, somebody. Can you see the wind? But you know it's there. So put your faith in God. Don't put your faith in man. We walk by, not by. I'm through. I'm through. Right choices results in right Consequences. I'm trying to close this thing. Remember, my soul is on fire. Young people, the choice or decision you make today will affect you. But here's the thing about consequences we don't know the time or the hour that the consequence will take place. You could be 24 today, and that decision that you made at 24, it won't come to fruition in a consequence, a bad consequence to your 34. Am I preaching all right? That's why every step, every move you make, you have to say, Lord, is this what you want me to do? Lord, am I making the right decisions? But see, here's the thing. Bible study readers, help me out. It's all about, now y'all was there last Wednesday. It's all about patience. Last week we talked about waiting patiently, doing what? Now I know I see some Bible studies here from last Wednesday. We wait expectantly. And we ought to do what? With patience. We're doing what? We are practicing. We're practicing patience. In those decisions, you got to practice patience. Because he may not answer right then. Because his time, and we use the analogy of a what? Mayfly? Was it Mayfly? Versus a uh, caterpillar? A mayfly only lives, for y'all who don't come to Bible study, mayfly only lives 24 hours or a few days where it takes days and days for a caterpillar to become a butterfly. Now for the mayfly, 
it may not seem long time because he only lived a few days. The Bible says a thousand years in our eyes is but a day. And a day but a thousand years. So what we think that decision you made uh, today, well, Lord, I've been waiting two years now. Lord said, no, nah, to me, it only been 15 minutes. You know, I've been waiting two years. No. Nah. In my eyes, you've been only waiting 15 minutes. But you think you've been waiting a long time. God said, no, you only wait 15 minutes. But I made a decision yesterday. No, yesterday for me was a few minutes ago. <laughs> right choice results in right consequences. Now, outside that balance sheet, wrong choices results in wrong consequences. So you got to ask yourself, am I living in the will of God? Because it's his way, his time, and his will. Stand to your feet. I'm trying to close this thing. Real, yeah. But here's the thing about God. Here's the thing about God. He'll let you make that decision. And you walk around thinking about it. And then what happens is you just like that prodigal son that came to himself. God, I've made the wrong decision. Forgive me. I want to make it right. Just like that prodigal son, God said, okay, son, come on back home. We'll make this thing right. He knows. We don't make our right decisions all the time. He knows. But the thing is, you be spiritual enough Amen. and godly enough to say, God, I'm sorry. I want to make it right. That's the thing about God. Even in your wrong decisions, he don't leave you. He's still right there. Come on and give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Maybe someone here don't know the Lord pardon their sins. Today you want to come say, Lord, I'm sorry.